Hello and welcome back to Vintage Wine Import. Today we have a very special interview with Anthony Symington and Thomas Symington from Symington Family Estates. Uh, you may know uh, their product, oh, wrong side, Graham's. Um, we've got this fantastic Graham's tasting event which is going out tonight. Uh, you'll be watching this in the future but you can still go and check it out. It'll be live uh, on our socials. So if you go to Vintage Wine Report on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, there'll be somewhere to point you in the direction of the tasting. Uh, you've got five fantastic little bottles, which are very nifty. Uh, the packaging is fully recyclable, which is a, a cool achievement hit for us here at Vintage Wine Import. Uh, and although you may not be able to get your hands on these uh, nifty little bottles, you can still get the full size ones uh, from uh, Vintage Wine Import uh, or go check out uh, Graham's directly on from their socials. So without further ado, hello, Tom. And hello, Anthony. How are you go, guys? Hi, Andrew. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, really well, thanks. It's great to be um, great to be chatting to you um, from uh, from the fake surroundings of the Doro Valley. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have you and and everyone watching out um, to visit in person soon. Yes, it'd be lovely to to head head on over. How is the weather there? Is it nice? Yeah, well, I'm I'm currently in Porto. Uh, it doesn't look like it from the photo behind me, but the the weather's quite nice. It's shining quite bright, uh, quite warm. So I don't want to make those in, in in the UK a little bit jealous. It's been a it's been it's been a warm winter actually. We've um, mm. bud burst was about three weeks earlier than than usual, um, which uh, which is obviously a, a little bit um, uh, worrying at this time of year if, in case a strong frost, frost or hail come. But touch wood, we're, we've been okay so far. Fantastic. Yeah, well, yeah. Hope, hope so. That's that's uh, fantastic to hear. And and what what kind of at this time of year? So it's April as we're recording this. Or what would you be? Uh, what would you guys be up to? What you're, what are you preparing for the the year ahead? Well, I'll let Tom as as winemaker carry, uh, cover the the winery and and the vineyard. Um, so commercially, this is this is the time that we decide uh on whether we're launching a vintage or mm. a or a single quinta um vintage port and actually yesterday the 14th of april we just we announced that we're releasing um single quinta vintage port from 2019 um we felt that the the quality was superb but the individual uh, flagship estates from each each of our quintas really had, were the best possible expression of each of the wines. So Graham's Quinta de Malverdes wouldn't have been improved blending it with the other Graham's Quintas around the, the valley. And so we've got these amazing terroir-driven uh, single quinta wines. The so single quinta wines really highlight the individual characteristics of each each estate. So with, with Malverdes, it's that lovely minty eucalyptus finish. Um, they're very lively, exuberant, uh, vibrant wines in, in comparison to previous years, which have been um, equally very good, but sort of more concentrated style. So, yeah, we're very excited to, to be launching them. And, and that, yeah, that is the main thing that happens for us commercially in April. Fantastic. So you're hard at work uh, making sure all the releases are ready. And, and what's going on with the winemaking, Tom? On, on the production side, well, the, the wineries are obviously sort of dormant, I suppose. Um, there's no harvest, so they're, they're sort of closed. And um, the vines, as Anthony said, we've already had uh, bud burst. I was actually up in the Deru uh, a few weeks back, and they were just beginning to uh, burst. It was pretty incredible, actually, seeing the differences from right down on the river, um, how, how quickly they, they, they burst. And then you drive to the top of the mountain uh, up to Kilazirtha um, and you climb about 300 meters and you see this slowly slow transformation from uh, vines that have bud burst to vines that are are, are just bursting to, to not at all and um, so it was uh, it, it's it's pretty interesting so right now it's quite a, a critical stage for the vines they're obviously got uh, young young uh, uh, green leaves and so um, we have to be really careful with the with the rain we're hoping we won't get any hail or intense precipitation because that can be a little bit damaging but uh, yeah fantastic so it's it's all it's quite an exciting uh, exciting period but um but it's perhaps not not your busiest period of the year yeah no, so it's, yeah. it's sort of um it's like the beginning of new life it's spring hmm. isn't it whereas actually we've done all the work and the vines are sort of doing their own bit right now. Nice. That's oh, that's, that's lovely. I hope you uh, hope you have a bit of a time to to. Although I'm sure you'll be hectic and busy with lots of releases and, and work, and uh, I hope you get a bit of time to relax and enjoy the the beautiful uh, uh, 
weather out there. Uh, and how long have you um, kind of been involved in, in this process? So that obviously the Simmington's a, a family uh, company. How long have you guys been doing the roles that you're doing now? Ourselves individually or, or, or the family? Oh, we'll, start, we'll start with yourselves individually and then we'll, we'll go through the, uh, the history books. Um, so I've worked in wine for, for, for a number of years and, and joined the family business about four years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, working predominantly in the well, working exclusively in the UK market. Um, so, so I look after the UK, um, which is great. Uh, it's a lovely blend of being able to spend time in 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 Britain, uh, visiting all of our customers, and and also balancing it with time back home in in Porto. Lovely. And yourself, Thomas? Uh, I, I studied uh, winemaking and viticulture at Montpellier in uh, in, in France. Um, and I've I've done quite a few harvests around the world. So Burgundy, uh, I've worked in Bordeaux, uh, Australia and Barossa, um, a little bit in New Zealand as well. And obviously uh, at home, I think both me and Anthony, when when we're quite young, we're, we're chucked into the Lagars uh, <laughs> before they're even sort of over our waist. So we sort of swim in the uh, in the grapes quite young. And then going into our teens, we'll do quite a few summers working the harvests. Um, at the moment, currently, I'm, I'm working with Anthony in, in the UK in the market, uh, helping out on that side of things. Um, yeah. So, so where you've been uh, out, out in the world and experiencing all these different kind of wineries, does, does this feel like uh, a quite a homecoming to be back, uh, back at the Symington? Absolutely. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be, to be in Porto at the moment working from home. So being able to work um, with with my cousins has been incredibly nice and to be able to experience the Duru, uh, especially at this time of year, which is, I don't normally get to, uh, to, to do. It's, it's been, uh, it's been a really nice period. Um, but very soon in a couple of weeks, I'll be over in London again, helping out Anthony out in the market. Well, lovely. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a really nice balance, isn't it? Having the, having the kind of best of both worlds. Uh, and you said earlier about, um, your family how long has the family been doing it so what is the so it's been passed down from generation to generation uh how how long has that been going back so, so tom and i are part of the fifth generation um and then our fathers uh, are the fourth obviously and it's it's lovely to be able to work alongside them and and learn from their 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 um their their experience um the first simington to arrive in porto was called andrew james aj and he he was only 18 He'd grown up in, in Glasgow um, on the edge of the city uh, in, in quite a big family. And there was, a, there was a recession in the early 1880s there. And, and aged 18, um, he, he went looking for a job as his uh, parents were struggling to support him and his siblings and feed the whole family. He couldn't find a job. And so to sort of save on, on the mouths to feed, he, he got on a ship. And fortunately for us, he, he got off in the city of Porto where he had uh, some connections. He started as a cellar hand at Graham's, worked his way up and then left and he joined uh, Warsport, um, where he eventually became a partner. And, and then with, with the War family, who were, who were in charge of Dow at the time, they, they merged so they could become re-involved uh, in their own family business. So that's how Dow and War came to be together and then and, and built into what they are today. And then in 1970, our grandfathers, my grandfather and Tom's grandfather, bought back Graham's, which is which is a lovely sort of cycle. So yeah, the Simingtons have been in, in Portugal making wine since since the 1880s, although AJ's wife, um, Beatriz Atkinson's family go back to the 1600s. So through one one line or another, we've been we've been there for quite a long time. Wow. Absolutely. And we've all um, we've all sort of grown up in the dairy. I suppose we've been in the dairy for almost 150 years now. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose not just growing up in the dairy and working in the business today, we, we, we've almost lived it and, and breathed it, working, like I say, quite a few harvests in our teens and, and getting involved at a very young age. Uh, mm-hmm. It's something that's really sort of close to our hearts, I suppose, something that's really special. The Duru and, and protecting the region, the people and, and trying to mitigate against climate change um, mm-hmm. is something that we're, we're working really hard to ensure. Mm, well, that, that, that leads me on very well to my next question. What, what are the sort of challenges where you've come from such a, a prestigious line of history? What, what are the challenges facing you for the future? You mentioned climate change there, but uh, 
what are the biggest uh, sort of hurdles for you to face in the coming years? Um, it, it is climate change. You know, throughout history, we've we've had problems that we've had to had to come through. Um, you know, the world wars, the trade was completely cut for a number of years. Those those were huge. Um, mm. The current one is is climate change. I mean, they talk about uh, a two degree. If the global temperature increases by two degrees, that's the point of no return. In the Dora, we're already at one point four degrees higher than we were on average thirty years ago. Um, so it's it's really is feeling the effects uh, at a greater rate than the rest of the world, and um, it's already one of the driest wine producing regions in the world. We get you know an average about five hundred milliliters of rain a year. So that's in in British terms, that's like a pint a pint of beer in water. You imagine trying to feed your house plants or your garden on that; it wouldn't last very long. So these mm. vines really are working on the bare minimum. And that all does help to produce the really concentrated flavoursome wines that we we are able to produce. But it's it's a real worry that climate mm-hmm. change. So we're working ourselves and with our partners and and you know colleagues, competitors in the Dura to really try and mitigate this. Um, and there are various things we can do, but we we need um, sort of a global action really. Yeah. Um, some of the, some of the things we've done, um, we've got some experimental vineyards um three of them actually with each with 50 different varieties that we're measuring how each variety uh responds to different climatic stresses and actually through that we've we've identified two varieties that were um lesser used and um, probably out of fashion of that they weren't the main common varieties making port alicant boucher which is more common in the alentasia region in southern portugal and Suzanne, and both of those bring acidity uh, and um and and volume in in those super dry years when when obviously acidity is key to the freshness in a wine uh, yeah. which can sometimes be lacking in in overly hot years i think this is something that's really quite advantageous for us is that we we or portugal i suppose and and especially the Douro has has stuck loyal to its its indigenous varieties over the years so whereas many regions would have would have um started planting these french varieties We've stuck to our, our 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 local varieties that have evolved over almost thousands of years to cope with this uh, dryness, uh, the heat, um, the dairy conditions. And as Anthony said, this this um, these great variety experiments. We've got great variety libraries with um, a huge amount of indigenous varieties, and we, we we're constantly testing to see which of these varieties are going to deal with the drought uh, the best, with the heat that's to come. Uh, the best and and it's quite interesting actually things like Turiga Nacional um, have been there's been quite a big spotlight on Turiga Nacional over the last five ten years it's really sort of come in as quite an important variety for, for climate change purposes very drought was resistant very heat resistant mm. um, and so you, you see UC Davis for example in California um, a big university they've planted 10 hectares of Turiga Nacional uh, I was speaking with Anthony earlier and he was mentioning how Bordeaux have classified uh, Turiga Nacional to be put into the blends. I mean, even one of the most sort of strictest uh, regions or classifications there are are, are, are considering Turiga Nacional. So it's, it's showing the importance of these uh, varieties. Mm. And what, what effect will that actually have um, a long term on, on the wine you know, for the um for the end user, if you will, someone who goes sit down, enjoy a, a glass of port in 10, 20 years time. Uh, w- what difference will they notice um, from wines 20, 30 years ago? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, we we try and um, preserve the, the style of each each house. Um, so Graham's is sort of opulent richness, Dow's with its lovely signature dry spicy finish. Um, so, so however we're making the wines, we try and try and preserve that that individual house style. However, you're you're right in that various different innovations uh, have have affected the way we make wine. And actually, one of one of the biggest ones is is uh, single varietal planting in the vineyard. So each variety uh, ripens at a slightly different rate, and they're not all ripe at exactly the same time. So we can pick. Um, each variety when it's at its perfect phenolic ripeness, uh, which means that the tannins are are better integrated, but easier to integrate. That there's no greenness, no raisining, um, 
And with young vintage ports from the sort of 60s, you, you often had to leave them for a number of years for that, um, for it to sort of stabilize and the tannin to integrate. Whereas now, because we're picking at perfect ripeness, we've got state-of-the-art um, winemaking equipment, that tannin is already much better balanced. And as a result, young vintage ports are approachable much younger than they were in the past. So that, that's a key, is that they will continue to evolve um, mm. as they have done, but they're also approachable and, and lovely to drink younger. It's interesting that vintage ports are becoming more approachable at a younger age. Do you think that will uh, make, make them more accessible for people? Because at the moment, well, you have to store them and, and perhaps uh, uh, leave them for, as, several years, maybe even decades, uh, do you think people will be more inclined to get interested in vintage port if they are more approachable at a younger age? Yes, yeah, I, th I think so. Um, there's definitely, it's it's a magical uh, uh, wine vintage port, it's sort of the king of port, and, and to watch it evolve over decades and, and see how, how it develops is, is special. And you know, often if you're, if you're given a case or you buy a case to try a few bottles at different stages of its evolution is, is a lovely thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely, as, as we all know, working in wine, um, we've all got different palates, slightly different preferences and tastes. And just because I prefer a more evolved style of wine doesn't mean that you have to, you might prefer the young fruity vibrance. Um, and so because they are approachable younger, that definitely opens up the the possibilities and uh and 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 opportunities to people with different different tastes um in portugal and and in france and the united states actually they do tend to prefer drinking a younger style of vintage port whereas in the uk we've always erred more towards the the more evolved uh, mature vintages so definitely definitely being able to drink them younger will will make it um, more approachable to to more people Brilliant, because uh, we've, we've certainly noticed here that, that, that Tawny and Kalita ports seem to be booming in popularity, perhaps because of that very reason, because they're immediately drinkable and uh, uh, aren't necessarily uh, as fussy. Um, have you noticed that as well, Tom? Have you noticed um, uh, Tawny and Kalita ports growing in popularity? And if so, why do you think that is? Absolutely. Um, there's been a, a, an increase in revenue of, of Tawny ports in the UK of 20 million over the last uh, eight years for premium tawny and I, I think that, that, that it's no coincidence I think one of the big shifts that we've seen in tawny port is the clear bottles I think it was um, grams and walls that were quite revolutionary in putting these tawny in, into clear bottles and it allows for the consumer to actually see the liquid and, and as you know tawnies have an incredible sort of golden amber tawny color mm. uh, and it makes the wine a lot more approachable especially to uh, those who uh, don't necessarily know what's in the bottle. And if they can't see it, it's probably harder for them to, to pick it up and, and decide to, to buy it and, and taste it. Um, so I think that's been pretty incredible. Also within the, the Graham's Tawny range, um, putting them in a, in a slightly shorter, fatter bottle mm -hmm. has certainly appealed to, to quite a few of the uh, rum and whiskey drinkers. Um, another thing I think that, that has push the, the tawny category is this ability to drink the wine quite chilled. We actually recommend sort of popping the, the wine in the fridge uh, 20, 25 minutes just to bring that temperature down a little bit. Um, and really those young tawny ports is, is the best way uh, to, in, to enjoy them. And it also maybe de-seasonalizes uh, port drinking as well. It means you're not so much sticking with a, a room temperature port at Christmas. You're you're drinking these like, sort of nice tawnies on a, on a hot hot summer evening after after dinner. Um, so yeah, there, there's I think there's quite a few reasons and drivers for for this uh, recent tawny boom. I also find um, that tawny is probably one of the most food friendly of the uh, dessert after dinner style wines. Um, it's its sweetness, but also its acidity lends it makes it able to pair with almost any kind of pudding, really, from ice cream, chocolate, creme brulee, um, and and also the traditional cheeses. So it's it's really versatile. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a lovely style. It maybe appeals to a broader range of palettes than than vintage. And, and like you mentioned, Andrew, not having to decant, um, it's ready to drink as soon as you pull the cork is is definitely a plus. That's really interesting. Although I am now very hungry for some creme brulee. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it's yeah, also on, on. great that the these wines at the end of the day, the 10-year-old, the 20-year-old, 
they've spent almost 10 years or 20 years in these beepers, these casks, mm. uh, very slowly oxidizing. So that means that when, when you open the, open the bottle, they, can, uh, they, they last a lot longer. So uh, it's quite a few of our family members actually well, and I, I know I've converted a few friends to this as well, but we'll always have a, a, a bottle of tawny in the fridge. Um, and that means at the end of a long day, whether it's a, a sort of a, a long uh, work day on Thursday and you just want to have a, a glass of chilled tawny in the evening just to wind down your day, um, it goes down uh, really well. And then it, obviously at the weekend, you've got you still got a bottle of port to to have after maybe prolong a, a, a nice dinner with friends, especially how we're coming out mm. of COVID restrictions. I think that's going to be quite uh, quite fun and interesting. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll get, get yourself a bottle of Tawny for the week and a vintage for the weekend. <laughs> so that sounds like the perfect plan to me. Uh, and to go, go specifically into um, one of the Tawnies you just released, I'll see if I can find it. Uh, here we go. Uh, it's the first one I picked, the, uh, the 1974 um, single harvest Tawny. So, uh, now, this is obviously a tiny bottle, but it normally comes in a, a very lovely looking red tube. What are your plans for the, the single harvest range? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with what's the release been like for the 1974? So the release, it's being released tonight at mm -hmm. the um, Vintage Wine and Port Tasting, and it will be an exclusive pre-release for VWP customers. So um, uh, as that's in the future, I can't tell you exactly how it's gone, but <laughs> I'm sure it will go very well. <laughs> One thing I'd like to say about the um, the 1974 and our single harvests in general, I suppose uh, the concept of how, how we choose our, our single harvest, we, we only bottle single harvest when we, when we believe that they're at their sort of peak maturation and balance. Uh, Charles, our, our uncle or, or our, our head winemaker, he'll assess these, um, all, all the tawny casks um, every year over quite a long period of time. And he'll only ever select casts that are at their peak maturation um, and perfect balance to, to be uh, bottled and, and released as a, as a single harvest. Do you think you're going to see uh, more, uh, more releases in the coming years? And do you have any inside track on, on what, what yeah, might be so, coming? I mean, we, as, as Tom said, we, every cask that's maturing in the lodge, uh, we taste on a yearly uh, or multiple times throughout the year to see how it's evolving. And, and often those will go into our age tawny blends, the 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, which are different. The, the component parts of each of those are different each year. So we need to be seeing how each wine's evolving. And occasionally we'll taste and, and believe that this wine is at its peak now and, and probably too good to go into one of those blends. Um, but maybe not all of the casts from 1994, for example, are at that peak. So we only bottle one or two casts that we think are really showing perfectly at this moment um, and and we'll continue to do that as we as we discover them the 1974 makes up the sort of key component of our cellar masters trilogy range which is uh, the 1940 the 1974 and the 1994 so three single harvest tawnies from each slightly different stages of evolution the the, the three different stages so um yeah, it's a key part of, of the ports we produce and will continue being. We, we, they're always released in limited editions. So once once they're gone, they're gone. That's really exciting. Does it feel, uh, knowing that, that you're, you're bottling um, casks from 1940, 1974, do, do you feel quite proud and excited that uh, your children and grandchildren might be uh, bottling the wines that, that you've made uh, in this modern day? Yes, I think it's one of the really special and lovely things about um, working for a family business is, is that although uh, my grandfather is, is no longer with us, every time I do a tasting of some of these wines, it's a tribute to him. You know, I'm talking about the wine that he and Tom's grandfather made themselves with their hands. And, and you know, our children, hopefully, and grandchildren will be doing the same. Um, which is which is really special to be able to pay tribute to to someone who's who's no longer here, particularly when they're a close family member. It's an it's an incredible thing to sort of what, what we quite often do before tastings is we'll go through the diaries of our grandparents or sometimes even great grandparents to see what the climate was like that year, to see what they were doing, what their challenges were. Um, and yeah, I suppose like Anthony said, it's a, it's a great testament to to um, to our to our fathers and our grandfathers sort of history in a bottle that's amazing that's yeah i can't think of anyone else that have that that same sort of connection through through the generations that's amazing uh, and to 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 flip back to um 
to vintage ports. Uh, one of the things you've, you've recently done to, uh, as an innovation uh, is you introduced port bonds. Uh, how has that changed the way you operate? Uh, can you explain a little bit what they are for somebody who doesn't know? Yeah, the, the vintage port bonds have been revolutionary. Um, is, is particularly for gifting, um, whether it's for a christening, a wedding, or, or a big anniversary birthday, um, giving port from from that year, the year of birth, year of the marriage, is is really special. Usually, what happens with vintage ports is the harvest the harvest occurs in in September in the autumn, and we make the wine, and then eighteen months later we'll release um, a vintage. So, for example. April now we're, we're declaring the 2019s it's 2021 um, obviously you you can't wait two years to give a, a wedding present your friends might be a bit upset with you if you don't uh, if you don't give them something and so it, the vintage port bond works as a future in a way so um, you you purchase a bond we we craft a very smart certificate it's all embossed and engraved with your name the recipient's name and a message um, which they then receive for their birthday, uh, wedding, uh, christening, etc., um, and then when the wine is released, eighteen months later, um, we we deliver that to you or to them, however you you decide. So it's almost two presents for the price of one, mm. uh, which is lovely. And they, they are smart. My brother-in-law, for example, I gave him one when my niece was. Well, actually, I gave my niece. Well, I hope my brother-in-law doesn't drink it all before she turns old enough. Yeah when she was born and he's he's framed it and put it in their downstairs loo so um they got, they're they're fun and nice mementos to have that's brilliant it's a, it's a great thing as well sort of two years later quite often people have have forgot forgotten about their vintage port that is, that's to come or, or or not not expecting it so it's a great mm. surprise to know that you've got a, a case of uh vintage port on its way so it's it's really fun that is really nice because yeah they do make wonderful a vintage port is a fantastic anniversary present because it's tied to a specific year. But as you say, having to wait 18 months to, to get that year is, it's a, yeah, a brilliant workaround. It's really exciting. Uh, and uh, perhaps you can maybe give us, so you've, you've already told us about the, uh, the 2019, uh, which, you're, which you're working um, uh, working on the releases that of, and information on that at the moment. Uh, do you have any uh, inside track on uh, what 2020 might be looking like? Yeah, so I um I work this harvest I work twenty twenty harvest and um it, it, we had we had really good conditions earlier on in the year I the year, the previous year twenty nineteen we had quite a bit of rain so the water reserves have, had built up quite well um, and also the previous year the the vines weren't um, pushed or they didn't struggle uh, too much so so their general reserves were quite good and they were quite hardy coming into twenty uh, twenty. Um, we had sort of quite drought conditions up, up until harvest, but with these water reserves, it, it looked like it was going really well. Uh, and certainly the first part of the harvest went uh, really well, picking at perfect maturity. Um, the Turiga Nacional came into the winery in, in really good condition, superb. Um, but it was halfway through harvest. It must have been around the 15th of, of September where... Um, all the vines, all the, all the vineyards and, and varieties almost decided to sort of pack up and, um, uh, and ripen, mature all at the same time. It had been this prolonged heat, uh, really hot vintage as well that, that started dehydrating the, the vines. So we actually lost about 30% of our crop um, in 2020. Uh, the quality we had uh, early on in harvest was really high. So we're, it's, it's going to be a small harvest, but it was certainly um, some, some wines would have come through with really high quality. Obviously, there's still another year uh, of assessing to see um, whether there, it's of, of, of vintage standard. But um, yeah, certainly an interesting one. So potentially scarce, but scarce, but excellent then. It might be the, uh, the outcome. And, and how has, um, also obviously the, the weather is always a, a factor in, uh, in the winemaking but how has the pandemic over the last year uh, affected the 2020 harvest and how, how you've operated uh, as a company? I mean uh, Tom was there in the middle of it it was definitely the Covid harvest wasn't it Tom? Absolutely um, it was it was it was probably a little bit sort of worrying going into the into the harvest because we, we we didn't know quite what we were going into 
But obviously, um, sticking with all the regulations, the masks, the social distancing. Um, but you can imagine a harvest operation where the Doru, you know, it has a massive influx of people from, from the surrounding regions to, to pick all the grapes. These, these terraces, these vineyards are all on terraces. And so there's very little sort of machinery uh, or, 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 or mechanization within, within the Doru. So it, it depends a lot on the people in the community. Um, and so coordinating this is incredibly difficult. And if we had teams, picking teams, winery teams, if we had a case within one of those teams, the whole team would have to quarantine. So we had to be extremely careful, um, really, really strict and um, uh, constantly adhering to all, 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 of, the, all of the rules. Um, it was certainly a difficult one. There's a lot of pressure on the picking, like I, I, I explained earlier. Um, but luckily we got through it all and definitely with a, with a fun spirit and a community feel. Mm. It was also it, key to the Vesuvio, um, where we make all our port exclusively by foot trodden. Um, and it, we think it's the second time in the history of the Quinta that um, there was no treading, which is, which is pretty remarkable. Um, quite sad, but obviously had to, had to be done. Um, 2021 harvest. Uh, it's sort of wait and see at the moment, as with as with everyone in the world, we'll we'll just follow the rules as as and as they become clearer. Yeah, so uh, it'd be a very interesting. Uh, well, you mentioned it earlier because the the because uh, the conditions, it might be a very interesting vintage anyway. But uh, perhaps historically and commemoratively, it would be a, a very interesting vintage for the future. Yeah, mm. uh, and uh, I suppose one thing that has come out of this, which might be a potential positive, is that we have moved to online tastings. So people can uh, get up close and personal uh, with yourselves and with winemakers all over the world without having to, to get on a plane or uh, spend, spend lots of money to travel out. Although it would be lovely and uh, I certainly will uh, be keen to get out there once, once we're allowed. Um, but it does give a, a greater option perhaps for more people to experience uh, wine tasting with the makers. What are your thoughts on, on online tasting? How have you found them? I think, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to be able to welcome um, everybody into our, into our homes, into our winery, and, and talk to them from the comfort of their own homes. Um, we, you're able to, to speak to a larger number of people from a wider geographical area than, than traveling around. And we all know that um, you know, travel is one of the greatest contributors to, to climate change. Mm. Um, and so we should, uh, uh, be mindful about how much we travel. Um, so that's definitely been great. I, I do think there is there's no substitute really for for in person interaction, um, chatting. You can you can judge people's reactions in a room, um, um, ask questions much more easily. So I, I think there'll be a, a blend of the two going forward. Hmm. Um, definitely, perhaps more 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 targeted in in-person uh, experiences and, and tastings to minimize that excess of travel um, and, and continue with these online tastings. Um, Tom and I were talking about there, there's, I think globally there's probably an element of Zoom fatigue that may wear off a bit as, um, as we all get back to normal and people might have less time to, to join uh, wine tastings. But uh, as if the, if these, platforms that have been remarkable throughout lockdown continue to innovate and improve then yes i, I see there being a, a balance of both going forward that's um pretty much everything i had to ask you you've answered uh, everything brilliantly it's, do you have any final thoughts or anything you want to say about the uh, uh about pacing tonight about any of the any of your products any any anything you want basically um, just, just one, just to thank you and, and everybody watching. Um, you know, we're we're a family business, um, and working with uh, with people like yourselves, Vintage Wine and Port, who we've worked with for generations, is is part of what makes it special. Um, working alongside each other, becoming friends rather than just um, you know customer supplier, um, mm. and that that's what it's all about, really. So, um, thank you everybody for your support, and um, I hope you all enjoy a glass of port. Absolutely. And I just want to end on uh, a quick point as well. This single harvest tawny tasting, um, a couple of months in the making, uh, thanks to you guys, VWP and, and Fells and the Porto team. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the best lineups of, of wines that I've certainly ever done uh, and certainly ever tasted in a row. So I'm really looking forward to it and I hope uh, everybody else is too. 
Mm. Well, we're definitely very excited here. Uh, I just uh, Tony gave me my uh, my box today, so I'll be going and enjoying it. So I'll see you tonight. Uh, if you're watching this in the future, um, which you will be, the tasting is still available. You can still go watch it and uh, uh, you know get the insight from the video, but you will have to go buy uh, individual bottles. Uh, I'm afraid, but it's well worth it. So thank you so much once again, Anthony and Tom, for joining me, uh, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you.